1995, when ministry was not something I anticipated for my life, and I knew next to nothing about Unitarian Universalism, I had a religious experience in the Mississippi River. Vacationing on a houseboat not far from La Crosse, Wisconsin, my friends and I had anchored ourselves on a sandbar and decided to go for a swim. After I made my way out into the river up to my neck, I turned to face the north, standing firm on the muddy bottom of this mighty, mythic river, my arms outstretched to feel the water rushing past me. I was moved by the power of the natural world and my tiny place in it. There was an energy I experienced in that river that day, and it called forth in me a yearning to communicate with my mother, who had been dead for more than seven years. I remember speaking a prayer to her, though I wouldn't have called it one at the time, asking for guidance for the next phase of my life. I was in my late 20s, just a few weeks away from moving to New York City with my fiance, Susan, but unsure of what I would do once I got there. Maybe having thousands of gallons of river water pushing against and past me led me to hallucinate. Or maybe there was something else going on that afternoon that defies explanation. But I did sense my mom's presence. I sensed that she smiled at my questions. It was a confident, loving smile. I didn't know what to make of what my mother or my hallucination was telling me, but I did know that I felt at home in that river. So much so that I stayed there for more than two hours before the setting sun demanded that I return to the boat. And I did return, but I wasn't the same person. My time in the river had changed something important, even if I couldn't name what it was. I thought a lot about that experience in the river and my life in ministry over the years. It seems I'm still standing in a river of sorts, a river of life, a river of love. On Friday, August 31st, 2007, I had just rolled out of bed when our church administrator, Mary, you're here today, aren't you? You remember this day. When our church administrator rang my phone, two men were going to be calling me about officiating their wedding that morning. I knew about a district court's ruling about 17 hours earlier that said to deny marriage licenses to same-sex couples in Iowa was unconstitutional, but I did not expect to get a call so soon. Sure enough, one of the men, Tim, called me moments later asking me if I would be willing to marry them. Of course, was my response, even as I acknowledged that it was not the normal way that I do things. I asked Tim a few questions about their age, where they were from, how long they'd been together. I was a little troubled by how young they were and how rushed it all seemed, but I knew that I couldn't say no. I couldn't say no not because I could be certain about their particular relationship or commitment, I couldn't say no because of all the other same-sex couples I know who have been denied their right to marry legally for so long. And the over 100,000, excuse me, 1,000 federal and over 500 states' rights and benefits that go along with a legal marriage. I knew I couldn't say no. So I suggested that we meet at church at noon. That would give me time to collect my thoughts, prepare a ceremony, take a shower, Tim was a little hesitant to wait, saying that the press wouldn't be happy about it. Oh, I said, you have the press with you. Yeah, he said, sorry about that. No problem, I responded. Of course there were reporters with them. However, it didn't yet sink in for me what this was going to mean. We hung up. I started thinking about what I had to do to get prepared. A cup of coffee might be nice. A minute or two later, the phone rang again. We have to do it now, Tim, and then Sean said, There's going to be a stay issued. We have to do it now. I could hear the panic in their voices. The window of opportunity was closing. I said, well, you could come to my house, but you know I'm not clean. I'm not dressed. (laughs) Mark, you can marry us in your underwear, they said. (laughs) Now that would have made for an interesting news story. About five minutes later, I was in my laundry room trying to find a clean dress shirt when there was a knock at my door. I yelled out, I'm getting dressed! You've got to hurry, was all I could hear. I gave up on the dress shirt. I threw on the closest things I could find, a polo shirt, a pair of khakis, and my sandals. I grabbed my stole. I walked out into my front yard where over a dozen reporters and cameras were waiting. There was a kind of manic energy present as I walked over to meet Tim and Sean for the first time. And as the cameras followed our every move, 
I quickly realized this was not only history in the making, but that I was going to be expected to say something, <laughs> that cameras would record it, and that people would see it. <laughs> For a long time, you could have viewed what transpired on the web. A local television station had what they called the raw footage of this on their site, and raw this ceremony was. Like when I called Sean Joseph. <laughs> yeah, I know. Or when I realized in a moment of pure surprise that the date this historic event was taking place was the same day that 11 years earlier I had exchanged marriage vows with my wife Susan. The exact same day. Check it out, I proclaimed. It's my anniversary. <laughs> Susan loves seeing that clip on the news. I said, you didn't remember it was our anniversary either. She said, that's not the point. <laughs> I barely offered the couple a ceremony. Time was of the essence. I mostly just signed the certificate and had them exchange their rings, and then they were off. At least one of the reporters said, is that it? <laughs> I said, yeah. Yeah, today it's about the legal document, and it was. But we all know that what happened on my front lawn that morning was about much more than that. It was about Tim and Sean's commitment to one another and the resourcefulness it took for them to be legally recognized. It was about all the same-sex couples I had known who had been denied their civil rights for so long. And it was about my calling as a minister, my calling to work for, and to defend love and justice in all its forms. And it was about the religion I am called to serve, Unitarian Universalism, a religion that does not require that we share the same statements of belief, but rather that we keep ourselves as open as we can to life itself. Not life as it is portrayed in any particular scripture or any particular religious doctrine or interpretation, but life as it is lived by our fellow humans life as it is lived. A religion that calls us to do our best, as we say at the end of our services here each week, to be open to life, expecting to love, and prepared to serve. About 15 minutes after the couple and their entourage had arrived, everyone was gone, headed down to the courthouse in a race against time, a race we all know they won. I called Susan to tell her what had happened in our front yard, <laughs> on our anniversary, no less, and we both decided that it was the best present we could have given to each other. Before our conversation ended, the calls started coming from all over the nation. It was amazing. I spent the bulk of the next four hours on the phone talking to reporters. It was a big deal then that some minister in Iowa married a same-sex couple. It's kind of funny to think about how big a deal it was. And I got to share my gospel of marriage equality on those phone calls over and over again. What a gift that was. I ended every call the same way. I would say, you know, I've lived in Chicago, I've lived in New York, and it's great to say they need to catch up to Des Moines. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Sometimes the reporters laughed, sometimes they didn't. The reporter from the Chicago Tribune said, oh yeah, that will happen. <laughs> <laughs> Once the reporter stopped calling, I received messages of gratitude and celebration from same-sex couples from all around the country, including a phone call from a woman in California who shared that she had grown up in Iowa and now believed she could finally move back. I got dozens of emails, too. Most were supportive. Some were poignant. Maria wrote to me. She said, I saw you marry the gay couple on TV, and I'm proud of you. Although I am straight, not that there's anything wrong with that, <laughs> I proudly support gay and lesbian rights. Part of my conversion occurred when I saw the happy faces of couples getting married in Massachusetts when their window of opportunity opened. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. I thought of all those who would be seeing the happy pictures of Tim and Sean and all the other conversions that might take place as a result. Kelly from Iowa City wrote, As children, we all grow up hearing our parents foster parents, friends, and other relatives talk about when we'll get married when we get older. Few people know that they are gay or lesbian as children, and even if they suspect, 
They don't realize that they will soon be pushed outside of their culture and denied the rights and responsibilities of family life as adults. I got choked up reading that one. I thought about one of our young people, now a middle schooler, but at the time was just six years old. She had asked me as she left the auditorium with her father a few weeks before the ceremony, if it's really okay, Mark, for two women to marry. I told her that in our church it's about love, so it really is okay. I thought about my own young daughter, who was not quite four at the time, and what her life would be like as she discovers whom she is called to love. And I smiled as I acknowledged that at long last, in Iowa at least, things were moving away from unnecessary discrimination towards equality, towards love. With every message I received, I further understood that I had been a part of something big. Still, as a heterosexual male, married at the time for 11 years to the love of my life, taking for granted all the attendant legal, financial, and cultural rights and benefits of that marriage, I wasn't really getting it. Not yet. For 18 months, the marriage I officiated in my front yard was the only legally recognized same-sex wedding in Iowa. A stay was issued so that the district court case could be brought before the Iowa Supreme Court, and in April of 2009, when the court unanimously, seven to zero, ruled in favor of marriage equality for same-sex couples, it was an amazing and historic moment. I figured that the media attention I had received would ensure a steady stream of requests to officiate same-sex wedding ceremonies, and I was right. But I didn't know what these opportunities would add to my life. I didn't know how my time in this river of love, as I have come to call it, would change me, but it has. Most of the same-sex weddings I have officiated have been for couples who have been committed to each other for many years, if not decades. Not only have these couples stood by one another through the ups and downs and uncertainties of life, but they have done so in the midst of a culture that is often sought to delegitimize, if not downright deny, their love. Witnessing their courage and commitment has made a claim on my mind and my heart, and I not only believe I am better for it, but that the unique position I have held as an efficient for dozens of these weddings requires that I remind you at least some of what I have seen, and that I invite you into the river with me. I have to tell you about the two young women I married who had fallen in love in a small town Iowa high school more than five years previous, who moved to Des Moines together after graduation and who had made a life for themselves here on a magnificent early May evening, not long after the Supreme Court ruling, amidst the blooming crabapple trees at the local park, I took my place at the gazebo where once the ceremony began, they would meet me to say their vows. As I waited for their procession, one of the fathers of the brides brought, uh, sought a conversation with me. He had not removed his sunglasses, and I was wondering if he didn't want anyone to see him cry. I could sense he was a little unsure about his daughter marrying a woman, but he thanked me for being willing to officiate. And then his voice seemed to catch in his throat as he said, you know, all parents really want is for their children to be happy. By the time these two women came down the aisle together, Big smiles on their faces, lots of family and friends, young and old, basking in the glow of their love. I, I was the one crying. I have to tell you that more than half of the same-sex couples I have married have raised or still are raising children. The weddings of these couples have all included mentions of love and care for their kids. In direct counterpoint to all the doom and gloom declarations of marriage equality opponents who have been declaring their concern for children as a primary motivation for their desire to discriminate. Anytime I hear this, but what about the children argument, I just want to broadcast into every living room in the country my memories of the faces of children beaming with pride and affection at the wedding ceremonies of their same-sex parents. At one of these weddings, a toddler shouted through the final five minutes of the ceremony. But he wasn't crying. He was shouting as if to say, hooray, it's about time. Ah! <laughs> At the conclusion, I asked the dozen or so people gathered to shout too. It seemed the right thing to do. Ah! <laughs> and it was. It was. You need to know about our friends and fellow church members, Denny and Patrick, who I married in 2006 in this room. 
but who didn't receive the legal rights and benefits of that marriage until they secured a marriage license the day they first became available to everyone. Local television hungry for a story of a same-sex couple getting hitched met us at the church for a makeshift ceremony. And in the interview that aired that night, Patrick declared his delight at being married in the eyes of God and in the eyes of the state. You go, Patrick, I cheered at the screen. Of course God affirmed their wedding, both times. After all, what kind of God would stand in the way of equality, justice, and love? I think of my longtime Chicago-based UU friends, two men who have been together for more than a decade and who traveled to Iowa so that I could officiate their fourth wedding. They'd already been married at their home congregation, then in Vermont, then in Canada. That's one advantage of having your loving, committed relationship not honored in your home state. You get to have lots of weddings. (laughs) It's not really much of an advantage, is it? About a year ago, I presided over the wedding of two women from Kansas, together 19 years, one of them named Susan, while their parents, siblings, and children looked on. The couple recessed to the same song that my Susan and I chose for our first dance after our wedding, The Power of Two. The ceremony took 15 minutes, and as the case with most of these weddings, my eyes were tearing up the whole time. Some of you may recall the nine couples who traveled to Des Moines with their ministers from Unity Unitarian Church in St. Paul, Minnesota, in a motor coach they called the Love Bus, for a two-hour ceremony of readings, vows, and tender moments. One of those couples would not have joined the bus, they told me afterwards, if it had not been for their children demanding that they go. Another couple, both women in their 70s, who had been together for more than 17 years, wore flower garlands in their hair and were quoted in the Des Moines Register saying their wedding at our church was like a dream come true. Volunteers from our congregation served them like the treasured guests that they were before the happy couples returned to Minnesota that night for a reception at their own church. Eight hours of bus travel for weddings that at the time would not be legally recognized in their home state and none of them seemed to mind, because for a day at least, these couples were not being treated as second-class citizens. They were treated as though their love matters, because it did, and it does. When members Walter and David asked me to prepare a homily at the celebration of their wedding a few months after the ruling, I had to ask myself what I could possibly say about marriage to these two friends of mine, who we all knew had been living as a married couple for 30 years. The only words I could find were a request that everyone present simply reflect on what these two men had been through, how much love they had shared, how many hurdles they had overcome to simply inhabit their loving relationship. And then I thank them on behalf of everyone present for their example of love and commitment. But what I should have said was, my friends, I am so sorry. I am sorry it has taken so long for this day. I am sorry for not doing more to bring it here sooner. I am sorry that I've taken my own marriage for granted for so long. That first fall, I officiated a wedding for a couple who'd been together more than two decades. Like many of the same-sex couples I had married, they didn't want a traditional ceremony. They just wanted me to say a few words and then sign the license. They even prepared a script for me which included a reference to their 20-year-old daughter. I asked, why isn't she here? And they said, she doesn't know about this. Why not? I asked. We don't want her to have to lie to grandma. These two women had raised a daughter, never fully acknowledging the love that they shared, fearfully never communicating the joy of that love to grandma, never fully inhabiting their lives. The marriage license I signed for them was from Pottawatomie County, far from Des Moines. When I asked why they didn't get one in our local county, they said they couldn't risk the chance that someone from their work would see the marriage announcement in the paper. Even as I celebrated their marriage with them, my heart ached for all they could not fully celebrate. Last year, I officiated in my office a tender ceremony for two men who met as actors in a Branson, Missouri, Lawrence Welk show. (laughs) 
They brought their two daughters with them, 19 months and two months, adopted from the same mom, a mom who was struggling with a meth addiction. They told me they had just stopped having to give the youngest meth three times a day. While the eldest daughter ripped up Kleenex at our feet, the two held hands and said I do's with tears in their eyes. One of the most moving weddings I've officiated was for a couple from Florida. The whole planning process took place via phone and email, so when I arrived at the Iowa State House steps one sunny Sunday afternoon, I wasn't sure what to expect. About 30 participants were gathered on one of the landings waiting for my arrival. I met the first groom and looked around for his partner who was seated on a bench several yards away. As he rose and slowly made his way to the center of the circle with the help of a cane, it was clear that he was living with some kind of degenerative disease that was inhibiting his ability to walk. I wasn't accustomed to having so many people present for a wedding for an out-of-state couple, so when the groom finally made it to the center, I asked them, the gathering, how many were there from Iowa? Less than 10 people raised their hands. Most of the people there had flown to Iowa from other places just for this moment. When we got to the Declaration of Consent, where I asked, do you take this man to live together in marriage, to love him, comfort him, honor and cherish him in sickness and in health, in sorrow and in joy from this day forth? Both of these men, these men who were fighting back tears, these men who had been together for 27 years, would not let me finish. Each, in his turn, interrupted me before I could complete the question with a hearty, I do. They weren't doing this to be funny or cute. They were doing it because they didn't want to wait another moment. They had waited long enough. At the conclusion of the ceremony, I told the men and their friends and families how much I appreciated being present for their wedding, how grateful I was on behalf of all fair-minded Iowans that they had come to our state to have it. We hugged and said our goodbyes, and as I started toward my car, one of the men said, Thank you, Mark. And then he added, almost like a warning, You know, you were the chosen one. I laughed, I waved goodbye, and making my way down the steps, he called after me, I mean it! <laughs> I returned to my car, and I did what I have done after nearly every one of these same-sex weddings. I shut the door, I sit there in the silence, away from all the people, and I cry. I do, I cry. I cry for joy for these couples finally being respected and affirmed, not despite their love, but because of it. I cry for the heartbreak that so many of them have and still will endure just for being who they are. And I cry in grateful response to the energy and power I have experienced from being granted these precious opportunities as a UU minister to stand in a flowing river of love and commitment, to have my feet firmly planted on the muddy bottom of our shared lives as these women and men, some familiar to me, some previously unknown, have poured into my life and then passed me, sharing their stories, their love, and their lives, and leaving me changed as a result. Look, I know this hasn't been about me, but I suppose I have been chosen. I have been chosen by my willingness to stand in this river of love, to be a witness to these stories, and to do all I can to pass them on. I have been chosen to lovingly and compassionately remind opponents of marriage equality that these are the lives of our sisters and brothers, our human family that we are talking about. These are families that we are talking about. This is love we are talking about. Love in a world that needs as much as it can get. I suppose I was chosen. So were all Iowans, whether we wanted this responsibility or not, because the whole nation watched us including same-sex couples and their families and friends who wanted nothing more than the equality that should have always been theirs. And here we are, six years into marriage equality in this state, and now the first few days into marriage equality for everybody in this nation. And so the river will flow more broadly now, joining the flow of equality that has been dammed up by ignorance and fear and unnecessary discrimination for far too long. 
Standing in the current of marriage equality in our state and seeing it now flow freely throughout the country has made me hopeful for other long overdue changes ahead. What rivers of love and justice might yet be opened in this nation? Rivers that we may have believed might never flow. We don't have to be stuck on the shore. We can enter into the water now. We can stand on the side of love and justice for all members of our human family. We can stand for the rights of immigrants. We can stand for even more expanded health care for all. We can stand for more income and gender and racial equality. We can stand for Black Lives Matter. We can stand for our world and for all the changes we want to see, not just for future generations, but for ours. For now that I have stood in one river of affection and rejoicing, and I have seen the world from the vantage point of justice and equality at last, I want to stand in more. I want to do this again on other issues. I want to feel what it means to be out in front and to see the river coming at me and to see it flow past and to know that I contributed, even in a small way, to the flow of that river. I want to feel the flow of more love, more compassion, more possibility for more people. How about you?